Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Polish Dragon P.I. Show, where I, Steve Zimkowski, the author of the Polish Dragon P.I. book series, shares with you old radio shows from the 40s and 50s pertaining to the private detective genre. Before we get started, I'd like to share with you that my latest book, Finding Amy, has won a Firebird Book Award in three different categories. It took second place in the novella category second place in the short stories, and third place in the mystery category. And if you are interested in reading the book, Finding Amy, a Polish Dragon P.I. story, you can find it at www.polishdragon.com. Today's episode is Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator, which aired between 1951 and 1955. Okay, it was, and his promos went as he was your man, when you can't go to the cops. So sit back, relax, take a journey back in time to when radio was the only form of home entertainment. This week's episode, Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator, in Corpse on the Town. And without further ado, here we go. Stars as Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator. <laughs> Refer to a guy as the ghost of his former self. Look twice at the getup he's wearing. He might be sporting a bed sheet. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Barry Craig speaking. There's generally a lot more to show business than what people finally get to see from the 480 seat. The backstage, behind-the-scenes shenanigans of what is delicately referred to as the pre-production phases. Brother, can it get wild? Wild and very homicidal. The particular case I have in mind began innocently enough. It commenced up near Yonker, in a rubble-strewn area that looked like an A-bomb testing grounds in the Nevada Flats. The ground floor door I went through read Luther Bassett, Canine Dentistry. Canine Dentistry. Inside, there was a guy in a short white medical coat. A pretty patch of hair on his chin in the style of old Vienna. Luther Bassett, I figured him to be right off. I'd never seen a goatee on a Joan. The dog with him was on the operating table. <laughs> later, in a cubicle off the operating room, Dr. Bassett and I tried to reach an understanding. I thank you for coming so promptly, Mr. Craig. Well, you phoned me. You said urgent. You said liberal payment. I liked your language, especially liberal payment. <laughs> now, uh, squelch my curiosity first. Uh, what do you fill a dog's teeth with? Uh, a T-bone steak? <laughs> the same as with humans. Amalgam, gold. The one you watched had lower bridge work done. Lower Bridgework, huh? Oh, that dog is a Broadway star. Oh, Fluff. You must surely know him. Oh, uh, when I go to the dogs, I do it on the east side of town. Never on Broadway. Oh, what play? The hit comedy, Mr. Galuli's Ghost. Oh, Fluff plays a big part. Oh, he gets a tremendous salary. Hmm. High living's ruined his choppers, huh? So, uh, what's the nature of my employment to be, Bassett? Something to do with dogs? Of the human variety. In show business? Yes. Oh, you're also in show business? Only as an investor. Uh-huh. How much? And uh, what theatrical? I have invested $20,000 in a proposed musical fantasy called 2055. 2055? The calendar year, 100 years from now. Oh. It is a fantasy about the end of the world. Oh. Amusing thought. Who's producing it? Stanton Bishop. And uh, what's your particular anxiety? Rumors that I've heard that the show is overfinanced. Is that bad? Well, perhaps I'm not using the right word. Wait, I think I know. A man has 100% to sell to investors, but he sells 150%. The show opens, flops, loses its nut, but Stanton Bishop isn't a bit worried. He has a load of sucker money salted away. If Stanton Bishop is a slender and not a legitimate producer, I must know. You must investigate for me uh, discreetly. Uh, do you want a retainer? <laughs> Foolish question. Money in front sharpens my talent. Uh, 
I found Stanton Bishop in a rented rehearsal hall on a side street along the main stem. Black Hamburg, pink cheeks, yellow teeth, suede shoes. When I found him, he was pulling producer's rank on a lot of long stem dolls and dancing types. Girls, tomorrow I want to see more bounce, more jump. The title of the number is A New World is Born. That means leaps and ecstasy. You've got to prove it to the customers. Dismiss for the day. I listened while he complimented the baritone. And Mr. Eduardo Bernard, you sang and all I heard was a television commercial for a mouthwash. Before signing as a lead baritone, you should first have your adenoid removed. You're fired from this show. When Bishop finished throwing his weight around, I tried abusing him. By what authority do you inquire into my private business affairs? This badge. Hmm. Chicken inspector. If I were a more sensitive man, I could get you a punch on the nose. No, no, I'm a, I'm a heart case. You punch me and you're a murderer. The book, please. The book? What book? The one you keep for your own information. The record of investors and money. Who and how much. Now, where do you keep it? Are you? In my safety vault. Not here in your desk? Here in my desk? Huh. Why? To accommodate sneaks like you? <laughs> that laugh sounded very falsetto to me. You stay out of my desk. It's, it's personal. It's sacred to me. Oh, I'll bet. Oh, would this be it? You give me that ledger. Hey, wrestle with me, Buster. Okay, if you must be placated. Oh. Now, uh, don't oversleep, Buster. I get through this book, my hunch is we'll have things to talk over. Bishop had his swindle written down in his personal ledger so plainly it looked like a confession to the D.A. Bishop came to, and we talked it over. Your musical is budgeted to cost $300,000. You've accepted investors' cash totaling over $400,000. Well, money for contingencies, isn't it? Baloney, who is a show angel named Eloise Finchley? She's in for a cool $150,000. She can afford it. Oh, I would imagine. Uh... Craig. What? Eloise Finchley's investment, it isn't exactly a straight stock deal in the show. Then what is it? Uh, more of a, a, a personal loan to me. You sure thought that little dodge up fast? Well, that balances my books, doesn't it? Take away Eloise Finchley's money, and the cash I have so far accepted is less, less, mind you, than my proposed budget. I'll believe the personal loan dodge after I've talked to Eloise Finchley. So, uh, what's her phone number? I don't want you telephoning her, Craig. Uh, how many times a day must you be rocked to sleep? I'm making a change in that script, if you'll notice, Craig. Uh-oh. And, uh, where was that gun up till now? Never mind. You look more like a hood now than a show producer. More in your natural element. Don't force me to shoot. Hang up that phone and get out. <laughs> Bishop's violent urge to get me out of his office at that moment was nothing impulsive, as I soon found out. It was strategy, plain and simple. Nor did he go far. Just a motor ride to the nearest Gretna Green. Gretna Green being shorthand for any place where marriage could be completed as fast as a couple could chirp, I do. I read all about it in the morning papers. It was a Broadway impresario, Stanton Bishop, marries socialite Eloise Finchley, and surprise elopement. At my first opportunity, I paid my respects to the bride. In a fancy bridal suite, almost as close to Central Park as the uh, statue of Sherman's Hall. Champagne, Mr. Craig? Conversation, Mrs. Bishop. You disapprove of my marriage? Your mister will never get through the pearly gates. Oh, is there a man without vices, really, Mr. Craig? How come you eloped with Bishop immediately with my investigation of it? How come? Now, let me see. Mm, yes. He invited me on a motor ride. It was perfect weather. The moon, Mr. Craig, you've never seen such a gorgeous moon. And that was it? Love doesn't stop to reason, Mr. Craig. I've heard. Bishop married you as a cover-up for his larceny. The marriage takes you off his books as an outside investor and puts it in the family. It, uh, balances his books. Must we really be so dull, Mr. Craig? So prosaic. I'm a bride... I'm in heavenly raptures. Yeah? You're heading for one big hangover. <laughs> I adore champagne. 
I'll leave sounding one last dull and prosaic note. <sighs> Must you? The sudden elopement smacks of conspiracy. Conspiracy to frustrate an investigation of Bishop's peculiar theatrical financing. Sweet matrimony was only a device for whitewashing him. How about that? You don't really expect me to testify against my husband, Mr. Craig. Okay. I know what I'm like. And you forget. $150,000 of the total on Stanton's books was my own money anyhow. My own money, Mr. Craig. Yeah. And frankly, that angle of it has me befuddled, perplexed, confused, and mystified. I reported back to my client, the canine dentist, Luther Bassett. Well, uh, who's the dental patient now, Bassett? Another famous dog actor? Oh, yes. This is Rinky Tintin. Rinky Tintin? Reputed to be a grandnephew of Ren Tintin. Wow, wow. Genuine aristocracy. And what show is Rinky in? The World and the Egg. It's a play about reincarnation. What is Rinky playing it? Napoleon. The dog is the 20th century reincarnation of Napoleon. Mm. <laughs> Mind you, it is an allegorical play. Yes, I get you. <laughs> mm. Well, you can leave your 20000 with Bishop or not, as you please. You mean the operation is legitimate? Now it is. I think I scared him into legitimate producing. I mean, if Bishop actually has the show business know-how for producing musicals. But he was first contemplating a swindle? With every breath in his body. Then I will withdraw my investment. Well, you won't get all of it. Not at this date. Bishop has had some pre-production costs already. But uh, salvage what you can. Go ahead. Well, my cost to you is 300 bucks. Pay me off, Bassett. <laughs> End of case. Only it was. It was just the beginning, as it turned out. The blissfully newlywed Stanton bishops were doomed to make more headlines. Gruesome ones this time. I saw it first on a street newsstand. Mrs. Stanton Bishop. I could only see that much. Hey, uh, give me that paper, boy. The whole headline read, Mrs. Stanton Bishop killed in street mugging. It had sure been a short honeymoon. I let official sources amplify the newspaper details for me. In this case, the first grade detective in homicide named Scotty. What's your interest in the late Mrs. Stanton Bishop, Craig? I mourn her passing. How did she go? A street assault. And what was taken? Well, so far as we know, her purse, a diamond wrist brooch, and her wedding ring. Uh, according to whom? Stanton Bishop, when he identified the body. Mm-hmm. Uh, what police results so far? None. No clue to the alleged mother? You hit the word alleged. Why? Because, frankly, I'm, uh, skeptical. Your reason? Nothing concrete, so I won't give it yet. What was the cause of death? Strangulation? A broken neck. She'd been hit with the side of the palm, a rabbit punch. It's a favorite blow with mugger. Or a killer trying to make it look like a standard mugging. Now, when did it happen? 54th and 9th. We found the victim in an areaway. Hmm. Hard to believe. What is? A lady of her style being at 54th and 9th to begin with. Eloise Finchley Bishop was Park Avenue. Very perfumed. Very upper class. Not always. Well, what would that be? Our check into her pedigree turned up some interesting facts. She was posing as a socialite, and her maiden name, Finchley, was an assumed one. Then who was she, really? Eloise Berkey. Father was a railroad brakeman. Parents now both dead. Eloise herself was a dress model when she worked. <laughs> Not that there's any law against posing as society, folks. No, there isn't only, uh... One thing really has me confused now. Yeah, what's that, Craig? Well, where would a sometimes dress model get $150,000 for a theatrical investment? I was around the rehearsal hall to give my condolences to Stanton Bishop personally. He looked a little different to me, this visit. The pink cheeks were sallow, deep lines in his face, like he'd had some new worries added. What do you want here, Craig? What was Mrs. Stanton doing on the wrong side of town? Now, how should I know? Well, what was stolen from her? I've already told the police. Uh, tell me. 
her pocketbook, a diamond wristwatch, and her wedding ring. Craig, you're not going to maliciously persecute me. Shouldn't I? I'm in mourning. I, I experienced a horrible tragedy. I think of how Eloise died. I, I have nightmares. I'm in a cold sweat. Sad. What's happened to our 150000 Craig, please, not at a time like this. Tough to answer, huh? Look, I'm straight, clean as a new baby. Maybe I had ideas once, wrong ideas, but all right, you cured me. Now, let me live. That depends on how your wife really died. She was attacked. She was robbed. Her neck was broken by some homicidal maniac. Oh, that's how it was made to appear. Then you are going to persecute me maliciously. At least until you explain to me how an ex-dress model was able to invest a fortune in your show. Also, uh, what really was the attraction that got you two married? Heckle me or embarrass me with the police and the public. You'll only make trouble for yourself. Did you murder your wife and father off as a mugging by a person or persons unknown? No. I tell you no. I tell you no. I did a further check into the background of the corpse with the grudging connivance of first-grade Detective Scotty. Craig, I, I can get reprimanded for this. Or promoted. Yeah, promoted for letting you into an apartment officially sealed to the public. Now, look, I saw this. I quietly turn the information over to you. I don't take a bow. You get a promotion and a raise. Boy, are you good at dangling sucker bait. Ah, well, Louise Berkey, Ellis Finchley, ex-dress model. Where did she ever get $150,000? Well... Squat somewhere, Scotty, while I look around. I came up with a ton of stuff, hidden away in bureau drawers, driven packages, and a steamer trunk. The personal stuff nobody ever throws away. Old letters, diaries, a high school pin, and picture albums. Lots of picture albums. The recent Eloise had collected the history of her life in snapshots. Yeah, she's in it from the first baby pose on a bear rug right to maidenhood. Yeah, Eloise in pigtails, in her school graduation dress. How she looked at Sweet Sixteen on her first date, as a slim chick in a one-piece bathing suit. How she looked as a dress... Hey, model. hold it, Craig. Well, what strikes you? That page of snapshots, the two shots... Eloise posed with a guy. Six pictures, the same guy. Well, what about it? Well, study the face of the guy. Now, you recognize him? Yeah, I've seen him. Why, sure, he's famous. Notorious, he's Artie Anzac. Big gun Artie Anzac. Big gun used to be. Oh, he's responsible now. Retired from the rackets, he's had it. Served 20 years in Leavenworth for tax evasion. Uh, this page of pictures, Anzac and Eloise... Uh... They look like very recent photographs. Watch out with Anzac, Craig. He's still king to a big piece of gangland. I'll be uh, most respectful. I've got a thing about royalty. <laughs> Anzac lived like royalty should. A heavily wooded estate on the outskirts of the city. With a high stone wall around it like the side of a mountain. I found him practicing golfing putts on a library rug. I talked while Anzac concentrated on his stance. When he'd figured out his answers, he gave them to me. Sure I know, Eloise. Sweet kid. Sweet dead kid? Yeah. Ain't it a shame? Out walking and that's it. Still, everybody dies. Some just go sooner. What was she to you, Anzac? A babe. I bought her a coat, I bought her one of them foreign cars, and then I moved on to another babe. Period. Period. I'm not poor. Spread the wealth, I figure. Did it bother you when Eloise married Stanton Bishop? No, not a bit. I'm for marriage. My mother was married. I even sent them a wire of congratulations with a load of flowers that cost me a C note. Craig, I already had another babe. Yeah, you said. Now I'd like to get back to my putting, huh? I'm in a tournament tomorrow. But I'm not through talking. What else, sir? Well, I'm at the point now of mentioning $150,000. Not a dough. Eloise invested that much in Bishop's musical production. Now, where would a babe get that kind of cabbage? I think from you. Hey, I'm not that generous. I think Eloise invested it for you. Idle money, hot money, undeclared income. Hmm. 
She was your front, so tax officials wouldn't be the wiser. You'd already served time for tax evasion. You'd had enough of that. Hey, that's quite an idea you've got. Oh, I'm loaded with ideas. I also think Eloise double-crossed you, that she invested the money for herself, and that Bishop knew the source of the money and what Eloise was up to, and that Bishop used that knowledge as a weapon to make Eloise marry him. Now, why would he do that? Oh, he had to make Eloise marry him. I'd been investigating Bishop. I'd found irregularities enough for me to alert the district attorney. Bishop had to find a device for shutting me off. I got practicing to do, Craig. I'm in a tournament tomorrow. I think you murdered Eloise to pay her off for the double cross. And as an object lesson for Bishop. So Bishop will respect your $150,000 piece of his musical production. I think you're the killer, Anzac. Watch this putt. Huh. Beautiful, huh? I left Anzac to drive home. Anzac's wanted a state to join the famous state park, popular with campers, hikers, and hunters. Signs on roadside trees advertised the two-week open hunting season. Deer was the big game. I almost qualified. A rifle shot through my side window that almost skinned my scalp. A wild shot, I wondered. Or was it a devoted Anzac subject trying to please the king? It was one of the things in life I'd never know. A chain is no stronger than its weakest link. Stanton Bishop figured to be the weak link. An easy mark for a trick designed to get corroborating evidence against a suspected killer. I found him alone in the rehearsal hall, chewing on a dead cigar. Craig, you soured my whole life. Oh, sad. I wonder how nervous you'll be, Bishop, strapped in the electric chair. Strapped? Me, Craig? For what? The murder of your wife. I've got evidence against you. Evidence? Those articles supposedly stolen from Eloise. So? So I've got them locked up in my office safe. Where, where could you get them? Right out of your wife's bureau. It's a trick. You're lying to me. You're trying to trap me in something. <laughs> but you can't be sure, huh? You had lived a story of stolen articles to make the alleged mugging plausible. Why were you so anxious to have it written off as an unsolved mugging? Who are you afraid of? Now, you clam up, you'll only be a fall guy, Bishop. But who's the somebody else, Bishop? Come on, it's trembling on your lips. Anzac. Artie Anzac. He murdered Eloise, and I'll tell you why. Oh, don't bother to. I already know why. Now, the guy answering this phone will be Scotty of Homicide. Tell your story to him. From here on, it's his case. Hello, Scotty. This is Barry Craig. Scotty, uh, I've got a guy here who's going to mean your raise and promotion. <laughs> yes, sir. A Craig promise is always redeemable in cash. You have been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, Corpse on the Town, was written by John Robert. Next week. And that ends another episode of the Polish Dragon PI show. You were listening to Barry Craig, Corpse on the Town. And remember, if you are interested in reading Finding Amy, the Polish Dragon PI story, you can find it at www.polishdragon.com and any other of the Polish Dragon PI books are there as well. You can also find them on the Kindle app for 99 cents each. So until next time, thank you so very much for tuning in and bye-bye. <laughs>